When I was a boy, I loved stories. I loved the way the little signals on the page that we call words could transport me out of my bedroom portals onto a Spanish galleon, onto the wine-dark sea, onto a British frigate uh, fighting in the Napoleonic Wars. I loved the novels of uh, C.S. Forrester. I loved his character, Horatio Hornblower, following him as he became midshipman, then a lieutenant, then a captain, uh, then a, a, a commodore, an admiral, uh, wonderful ways to travel the world. But I was also sensing that there were fundamental truths that were emerging from these novels that were teaching me much more than school taught me. For example, when I was a schoolboy, I came across this particular line. I thank God daily for the good fortune of my birth, for I'm certain I would have made a miserable peasant. <laughs> and I was growing up in Africa, surrounded by many people who were less well off than we were, and I don't think until that moment it had registered that my lot could have been different. And when I became an adult, I stumbled onto this following quote from Dorothy, uh, Dorothy Allison, and she said, fiction is the great lie that tells the truth about how the world lives. And that exactly captured my sense of what stories were all about from the time I was a boy. I went into medicine because I thought medicine was very much about story and I was never disappointed. And I see my, my writing, such as it is, emerging out of that same passion for medicine and story. And I wanted to share with you a passage that I'll recite for you that has to do with the death of this gentleman who in his time was the most famous physician in the world. This is Anton Chekhov, uh, not to be confused with this Chekhov. <laughs> Chekhov unfortunately died young of tuberculosis, of a very treatable condition. And in the last year of his life, he married. He married the stage actress Olga Knipper, and she knew that he was gonna die, he knew he was gonna die, and they had a wonderful year together. And in the last year of his life, he suddenly decided he wanted to go to the Black Forest of Germany, to the Badenweiler Spa. And being a dying man, Olga was not about to deny him, so she took him there. And when he first got there, it seemed magical. His color peaked, he stopped coughing as much, and uh, he had a lot of energy. But then on the fifth day, he broke out with massive hemoptysis, coughing up of blood, which is a terrifying symptom for both a patient and a physician, because not only are you losing blood, the airway is compromised. And so they called the spa physician, a man by the name of Dr. Schwer. And the passage that I am about to recite is from Troyat's wonderful biography of Chekhov, and the passage goes like this. The windows were wide open, but Chekhov could not stop panting. His temples were bathed in sweat. Dr. Schwer arrived at two o'clock, and Chekhov, in a final reflex of courtesy, leaned back against the pillows and said, Exturbe, I am dying, mastering his weak German. Dr. Schwer ordered a camphor injection, but Chekhov's heart failed to react. Dr. Schwer was about to send for an oxygen pillow when Chekhov, lucid to the end, protested in a broken voice. What's the use, doctor, he said. Before it comes, I will be a corpse. And so, Dr. Schwer ordered a bottle of champagne. When it came, Chekhov turned to Olga, his wife, and he said, it's been so long since I've had champagne. He drained the glass, he lay down, he turned to his left side, he stopped breathing. He had passed from life to death with characteristic simplicity. It was July the 2nd, 1904, three o'clock in the morning. A large black-winged moth had flown in through the window and was beating maddeningly against the lamp. The sound was very distracting. Dr. Schwerer withdrew after a few words of consolation. All of a sudden, there was a joyous explosion. The cork had popped out of the champagne bottle. Foam was fizzing out after it. The moth found its way out into the sultry night. Silence returned at last. When dawn broke, Olga was still sitting and staring at her husband's face. She would write later that there were no everyday sounds, there were no human voices, there was only peace, beauty, and the grandeur of death. I don't know about you, but I love that passage. I love it because it's so tender. It's about one of my heroes, 
But I also love it because I identify with Dr. Schwer. I've had the privilege or the misfortune of taking care of several dying physicians, particularly in the AIDS era, but also subsequently. That's a very difficult thing. You're, you're drawn to them as comrades in arms who have fallen in the battlefield, so to speak. But at another level, by definition, you have a very difficult patient on your hands. <laughs> and here's Dr. Schwer, who's retired from, I don't know, an academic setting where he's gotten away from the publishing parish or from a busy private practice, and he's found this gig in the Badenweiler Spa in the Black Forest of Germany, uh, where the worst thing he might have to deal with is an ankle sprain and perhaps a upset stomach, and all of a sudden, he's called in the middle of the night to take care of the most famous physician in the world at the time, who was dying. And he tries to cure, he administers the camphor injection, he's about to get oxygen, and nothing he does is really going to count, and Chekhov stops him, and then instead of giving up at that point, he orders a bottle of champagne. He does something incredible, which, at least in the telling, seems to set in motion everything that follows. Dr. Schwer functions as a catalyst. And I love that story because it illustrates that we in medicine are very often engaged in story. Most often we have little bit parts where we're privileged to enter the dramatic story, but every now and then we get to be catalysts. Now, you all know, and I won't belabor this point, that the essence of story from the time of Aristotle, uh, who spoke of the arc of story, stories are about conflict, crisis, and resolution. Or, in a more modern way, in Hollywood, they talk about the three Ds, how drama equals desire plus danger. And I think we in medicine are good at superficially labeling the stories. If you come into our hospital complaining of chest pain, you become an R-O-M-I, or a Romy, rule out myocardial infarction. And the next day, with any luck, you become a Miro, M-I-R-O, myocardial infarction ruled out. And you travel down increasingly narrow chutes, and you might wind up with a cabbage, coronary artery bypass graft. And I think these acronyms are sort of a simple entry into story. But I think we often miss in medicine the real heart of story, which to me is the epiphany. Now, that is a term introduced by James Joyce. James Joyce was talking about epiphany in the context of a story, and he spoke of it as that moment when the soul of the commonest object seems to us somehow radiant. The object achieves its epiphany. I think of it as that aha moment in a story when your consciousness is suddenly expanded, or that of the character, or both at the same time. And to illustrate epiphany, I'd like to use one of Joyce's own beautiful stories, uh, The Dead which is from his collection, The Dubliners. It's the very last story in there. And it was made into a movie, and the images are borrowed from that. Basically, it revolves around a couple, Gabriel Conroy, who's an academic, and his wife, Greta. And it happens on January 6th, on the Feast of the Epiphany, 1904, same time as Chekhov. And every year on the Feast of the Epiphany, Gabriel's elderly aunts, two aunts, spinsters, hold this feast. And there's much celebration, there's great food, there's great drinks, and Gabriel has a little speech that he has to give. And he's quite tense about the speech until that moment, kind of like a TED talk, until that moment when he finally gets to deliver it and it goes off pretty well and Gabriel's quite satisfied and there's more food and wine flowing. And then finally the evening's winding down and Gabriel's looking forward to it because they've left the kids at home and because it's snowing, They've booked a, a room at an inn nearby, and he's looking forward to this, this occasion without the kids, make love to his wife, have a very tender evening with her. And he proceeds to go down the stairs to get his coat, her coat, his coat. Uh, and as he goes down the stairs, uh, his wife hasn't quite followed him. An uh, Irish tenor begins to sing this beautiful song called The Lass of Ogrim, a haunting, beautiful melody. And when Gabriel looks up from the coat rack, he sees Greta having come halfway down the landing, and he does not recognize her. Her eyes are closed. She's framed against that stained glass window, the veil around her, conjuring up this Marian image. He's never seen his wife like that. And then the next moment, as the song unfolds, uh, her eyes open, and they're glistening with tears. It's a La Pieta image. And Gabriel is astonished. And the song eventually ends. She comes down, they retire to the inn, 
And he's so looking forward to this moment, and she unpins her hair, it comes cascading down, and he asks her, what, were you, what are you thinking about? Because she still seems preoccupied. And she says, I'm still thinking about that song, The Last of, the Last of Ogrim. It reminds me of a boy, Michael Fury, who used to love me. And Gabriel immediately becomes jealous. He feels his jealousy rising. And he says, and what's, what's happening to this Michael Fury? Where is he now? And she says, well, actually he's dead. And he is deflated. And he says, and what did he die of? And she says, well, I think he died for me. And she begins to cry. And she goes on to tell him that when she was a young girl living in Galway, Michael Fury was uh, an invalid, convalescing from a very serious illness. And she and him used to go on walks. And to improve his health, he would sing. And he had a beautiful voice that he would sing the last of Algram. And just before she moved to Dublin, he got quite sick and was confined to his sick bed. She couldn't visit him to say goodbye. And the night before she was leaving, she heard rocks being tossed at her window. And when she went to the window, she saw Michael Fury in the cold and the rain, standing there, having left his sickbed to come to say goodbye. And she says to him, you shouldn't be here. You should go back to your, to your sickbed. And he says, if you leave, I don't care if I live anymore. And at this point, Greta breaks into sobs, lies on the bed, and gradually drifts off to sleep. And poor Gabriel, this is much worse than a headache. All his <laughs> plans are off. But more than that, he's standing there feeling that his life is somewhat hollow when compared against the kind of love that Michael Fury had. He's feeling like a penny boy for his aunts, and he's feeling like a coarse vulgarian entertaining the crew at the dinner compared to what he's just heard. He's never known this about her, and it makes his whole life change in comparison. And as he looks out of the window and sees the snow falling all over Ireland, falling over the plains, falling over the waves of Shannon, falling over that cemetery where Michael Fury lies buried, drifting onto the crosses and the fence, falling on the living and the dead, he has his epiphany, which is this. Better pass boldly into that other world in the glory of a, of a passion than to fade and wither dismally with age. Better to pass boldly into that other world in the glory of some passion than to fade and wither with age. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the heart of story. And I think we all struggle to find our epiphanies, both in our stories, but in stories around us. I want to share with you, as I wind down, my own epiphany, which came in the AIDS era. I was a young physician, and for a decade, we had no treatment for HIV. And I presided over the death of hundreds of young men, most of them my age, a very difficult thing. And I remember one morning being in clinic and looking at the clinic roster and seeing that a young man who I'd gotten to know very well, because you knew them very well as you watched this trajectory, was coming to clinic. And I was sort of pleased I hadn't seen him in a while. And just then, the phone rang, and it was his mother to say, he's not coming to clinic. He's too weak to come to clinic, but he's not sick enough to be put in the hospital, and in any case, there wouldn't be much I could do for him in the hospital. And that didn't sit well with me all day. I, I wrestled with that, and that evening, for my own purposes, I decided to drive out to his house in the country, uh, to a trailer, uh, you know, an hour drive, uh, for my own needs. And, but when I got there, I found to my amazement that my visit had a profound effect on the family, on him. It helped the family come to terms with his illness. It helped him understand and take away some of the fear of death because we were able to talk about it, and I was able to promise him that he would not suffer, that I would be there through the end. And as I left the house that day, I realized this is what the horse and buggy doctor of 150 years ago did so well. In the absence of half, a quarter of the things, a fraction of the things we have today, they were able to heal even when they could not cure. If you think about it, if you have a fracture of your arm, at one level it's a physical problem. It's a mid-radius fracture, mid-shaft fracture, non-displaced. At another level, there's always a spiritual violation. Why me? Why now? And with diseases like AIDS or cancer, again, there's a physical loss. A virus infecting cell, cells that have gone berserk. 
but there's an incredible sense of why me, why now, what did I do to deserve this? That sense of spiritual violation, I think we in Western medicine didn't address as well as we should have. And my epiphany was to understand that even when we could not cure, we could heal. And we could heal by our presence. We could heal by being with the patient. We could heal by connecting with the family. Uh, we could tap into that age-old tradition, the ministry of healing. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that stories are the way we find meaning in our lives. Stories are equipment for living. The epiphanies we read about and we discover as we analyze our own stories are what allow us to change the prow of our ship and point it in a slightly new direction. Stories are how we connect with each other, only connect. In the words of Albert Einstein, who was paraphrasing Cameron, not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. For the things that can't be counted, you will need story. Thank you.